everyone who's joining us today for our third Facebook Live session about engaging students from the cold community. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet and acknowledge any, um, the, pay my respects to the elders past, present and any Indigenous people here today. Uh, looks like we're a bit sideways currently. <laughs> Um, so if you're watching us and you can look sideways, we'll try and fix that for you. Um, but I'd like to say we're happy to be able to present this session today as part of the Public Water Safety Initiative as funded by the Victorian Government. And as I said, we're talking about how to engage um, cold students in swimming and water safety. I've got my uh, expert panel here today. Um, we're joined by uh, Bridget, who's from Melbourne City Baths. Um, Bridget is the Aquatic Education and Programs Coordinator at uh, City Bars. She's been in the industry for 10 years, um, having worked at a variety of aquatic and recreation facilities in varying roles across Melbourne. Just, thank you, Bridget, for coming along. Thanks for having me. Uh, we have Lucia, who's um, currently teaching at St Dominic's um, in Broadmeadows. Um, Lucia's been teaching for 15 years and is currently grade one and two at St Dominic's School. Um, she's been there for eight years um, and has spent six years teaching at an inclusive school in extremely underprivileged, highly cold area in the east of London. Um, and she's also in her second year of her master's um, studying wellbeing at ACU. Thank you for joining us. And at the end, we've got David Holland, who's our Multicultural Projects Manager. Um, so in 2007, David established our LSB's inaugural Multicultural Projects Department um, with a view to bridge uh, the gap the, uh, in water safety education for coal communities. So today, the award-winning initiative partners over 400 separate culturally and linguistically diverse community agencies and schools in rural and metropolitan um, areas to deliver education, training, employment opportunities to over 22,000 coal participants annually. That's huge. Um, prior to this, David combined his PE teaching, ESL and aquatics at secondary and primary levels in both domestic and internationally um, with aquatic and recreation management for over 20 years. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. So today um, the session will be recorded. So for anybody who's not able to join us today, you can watch back through our um, uh, Facebook news feed. It will be also available on our uh, Swimming and Water Safety Toolkit. So that's available to watch as well as you can uh, read any comments that come through. So if you are watching and would like to participate or have a question for our panel members, we encourage you to use the um, chat function on, uh, on Facebook Live. You can ask us questions, we'll answer it live for you. Um, we'll also paste any links there to um, any resources or web pages that we talk about as we go. So make sure you um, check out that chat function as well. All right, we'll get into the session. So firstly, I think for anyone who's joining us who's not um, from a coal community or hasn't heard the term before, David, I'm going to ask you, what is coal? What does that mean? I guess the term is relatively uh, self-explanatory, culturally and linguistically diverse. Uh, I guess uh, when I was at school uh, and growing up, the term would have been multicultural. And, and even now, it's, it uh, goes between the two, the two terms, multicultural and coal. But, but I guess effectively, uh, it's people coming to Australia that have a different culture and language uh, originally uh, than what um, more established uh, Australians have. And so that's uh, Life Saving Victoria's target group uh, for, the, for the multicultural Department. And as you mentioned before, it, uh, it's 22,000 people a year that we, uh, that we, we target. Um, that's after 12 or 13 years. It started coming in around about 1,000. Um, 
Now, Victoria is a very, very multicultural state, as is um, Australia. So we're targeting people who are more recently um, arrived, as opposed to, you know, for example, people coming in the 1950s and 60s, and there's been a lot of generational change. Uh, but it's, it, 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 it is the groups that um, are more recently arrived that um, are more vulnerable around water. Yeah. So I found some statistics that say 47% of Victorians are born overseas or have at least one parent that was. And when I read that, I was quite surprised by that. Um, the other thing I read was overseas migration will be the biggest contributor to Victoria's growth with over 65,000 um, people coming to Victoria annually, which I think for me was quite a surprise. I guess, how do you think the changing face of Australia or Victoria and becoming such a multicultural country affects um, swimming and water safety and um, why do you think culturally and linguistically diverse people are so highly um, represented in our drama statistics? Uh, well, um, to answer your first question, what would an expanding and more diverse, uh, uh, what are the ramifications of that? Right at the moment there, certainly for the more newly arrived, there's a water safety education gap and there's a I guess a, a learn to swim gap as well. So for the last 12 to 13 years, we've been trying to bridge that gap um, in that time. So in the future, the implications are that as the state gets more and more diverse, if you don't do something about it, the gap is, is, is only get, going to get bigger. Um, so we're continually playing the catch up. Yeah. And the reasons uh, why these groups or well, the more newly arrived people uh, tend to get into trouble around water uh, is probably because of their um, traditional and current barriers to participation in aquatics. Um, in countries of origin, it's simply not high on the totem pole of, of priorities. There's so many other things um, that they've had to deal with in their countries of origin and then you come to a new country and then there's so many other things that you've got to deal with as well and, and the barriers are, are relatively obvious um, one being language um, job, education uh, money is a major one transportation uh, just the in many, for many people they're coming from landlocked countries so to come to a, a, a vast land that's flanked by water uh, both on the peripheries and, and on the inside that's a, that's a very new thing and, and it uh, poses real problems. I think, I think it's also the perception of the risk around water a lot of them don't have that understanding that people that grow up in Australia and the kids swimming lessons and that have that understanding so they'll come to Australia and jump straight into a pool with um, not understanding kind of the risk associated with it, and that's where a lot of that gets into trouble, or they'll go out to the beach and they've seen Bondi rescue and think, oh, that's great, great, for swim, and it's just that perception of the risk that they don't yet understand or have that grasp of. Yeah. I think I was watching um, one of the YouTube videos, Dave, that you were in, and you said that, um, I think there was a recent drowning, and you said they just didn't understand the mechanics of a rip. And I think that was such a good point because I think a lot of Australians don't understand the mechanics of a rip. So trying to get um, that message out and cross a lot of other barriers, like you said, language is a barrier. Trying to get those educational messages out is such an important thing for us to do. Um, Lucy, we're talking about barriers to participation. Um, obviously working in a school with a large multicultural community. Do you see that there is a barrier for students to participate in these programs? Definitely. A lot of the time, um, the barriers are, can come from fear. A lot of people who have arrived here recently have been through trauma. Sometimes that trauma does involve water, and it 
really um, reduces the likelihood of parents to encourage their children to take swimming lessons. Um, if it's not something that a parent feels comfortable with, they're not going to feel comfortable taking their children swimming. So a lot of the time that's where some of that, um, yeah, that lack of knowledge or lack of understanding comes from. Financial reasons are often um, a huge barrier because swimming lessons cost money. And so if you've just arrived, your priorities aren't going to be, I better get my children to learn how to swim. They're going to be furnishing their home or sending their children to school, getting uniforms, getting shoes. They're not going to be the main things um, at the forefront of their minds. So that's a huge barrier as well. Also, often they might not know about the facilities that are around. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of parents not actually realise at our school that um, the leisure centre is just down the road um, because they've not been shown. Yeah. So, yeah, there are lots of barriers. Yeah. And Bridget, do you see the same sort of trend happening um, <coughs> from the aquatic facility perspective? Yeah, um, we're quite unique being in the city that the majority of our school participants are either um, newly arrived in Australia or, or international. Um, Orange, either parents or other from overseas, but that figure forty seven percent of Victorians are have an international parent or international themselves. Um, so we have got a quite unique setup that a lot of our families it's the perception and the understanding that they've come in with our water and kind of re educating them about it. Um, we're a big water and water facility, um, which is a LSB initiative about making sure parents are supervising their kids and even something as simple as Near what your kids in the water is a really hard message to even get across to those families. So, um, we've done a lot of work in trying to um, make it accessible to people in different languages and educating them all. Um, so, it's a really big thing that it is that gap that we're talking about of what they understand, what they don't understand, um, and what we can kind of do to bridge it in a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you're watching uh, through Facebook, uh, if you have any comments that you'd like to share, if you've got barriers that you'd like us to discuss, please feel free to pop them in the comment section um, and we can discuss it as a panel. Um, continuing on with the theme of what the barriers are, we know that there are barriers. Um, we've talked about language, money, transport, education. What are we doing? Um, I'll start with you, Lucia. What are you doing at, from a school's perspective to um, minimise those barriers or get the students involved without the barriers? Um, so at St Dominic's School, we really value swimming and the skills that, that swimming gives um, children. And so because of that, um, the school decided to fully fund all students to have swimming lessons each year. Yeah. So it's taken away, and, and yes, yeah, it's because it's funded, that's taken away the financial aspect. Each year level, each child in each year level is given um, two weeks of swimming lessons each year. Um, transport's provided, you go down to the Broadmeadows Leisure Centre for two weeks in each year, and the children are giving, given swimming lessons. Um, so that is a huge, I guess, weight off that um, the parents don't have to worry about when it's um, when they're unsure as to well, what does this involve, what do I have to do. The parents are welcome down, and that's a lot about um, building those relationships as well, showing the parents that um, swimming's not scary. It's so positive, and it's such a great um, thing for the children to learn. And also, through that, we've had lots of um, parent swimming classes as well. So really building those relationships, building trust with the parents and saying, swimming's an amazing thing, you can do it as well. And so we've got quite a few parent groups that have now learned to swim. Um, and through that, building those relationships, building that trust and providing that financial um, assistance or support um, all of the students and the parents now so are able to, yeah, to, invite, to join in. To invite your parents to come to um, the parent classes and to educate them what swimming lessons and water safety lessons are, how did you do that? Did you need to use translated resources? Did you use someone from the community? Was there a type of 
way you presented the information to them? It was a bit of everything. And actually, I think it started from a conversation um, with some parents. Our community hub is an amazing resource where there are lots of translators and lots of programs for parents to come in. And there was a parent excursion to the beach and hardly anyone swam. And it was through having that conversation with the parents and with the mums in particular, saying, well, why aren't you swimming? And it was that we don't know how, but we'd love to learn. Yeah. And so that became then um, a small group of parents swimming. It got bigger and bigger through word of mouth, through translation um, and through the community where then it, be it became two groups of parents to then parents deciding that they wanted to do the training, the teacher training themselves. So it was slow, it was through conversations, through building trust, through translations, but yeah, it just started with listening to the parents and what they wanted. Yeah. And that was really powerful. It's incredible. Yeah. I think that's a great story of community involvement. It's not one person doing one thing, it's tackling the situation from multiple um, directions and involving the community. Um, and I think it shows the importance of understanding what your community is and who lives in your community and how you can cater for their needs. Mm -hmm. um, but for someone who's new to, say, an aquatic facility, so a brand new team leader or uh, a new teacher, how do I find out that information? Where do I know, how do I know where the community hubs are and where do I go to find out what my community demographics are? I might jump in here. Um, so with, um, I know from just being in different areas, um, the council websites are normally a really good place to start. Um, on that you have kind of your census, so you know kind of what your demographic of the areas are made up of, um, which kind of gives you a good indication of what are your kind of target audiences for your programs. Um, from there you also have, um, every council will have a multicultural team or a hub. Um, within Sydney Melbourne, we're very lucky that right around the corner from us we have our multicultural hub, um, which is an amazing centre that brings everyone from all the different areas in Melbourne into one place. Um, so looking for those groups, um, you can look up your social, so your online groups that are for the different ethnicities, um, getting in contact with them and saying, look, are you wanting to potentially partner up, like we'd love to kind of show them the facilities or here's a program we'd love to work with you. Um, we've been, we've, within our kind of own community, we're, we're at Grand Albury University, so we've just started a university program with RMIT and Charles Sturt University. Um, Charles Sturt is a very much unique international student university, um, which funded classes for the students, which was amazing. So it's building up those partnerships in your community, um, and from there you kind of, it's kind of like a bit of a domino and a bit of a Tetris game because once you kind of find that one piece and get that contact with that person then all of a sudden they'll connect you to the next person and it kind of goes on from there mm -hmm. um, so you can't just kind of stick within your four walls you've kind of got to go out to the community and start making those contacts and not being afraid to send them an email or give them a call and just have that first initial conversation because from there it just kind of picks up and goes um, which a lot of that's what's happened in our facility a lot of our programs have been started with a conversation and then all of a sudden the walls got rolling and now we've got these amazing programs running for our whole community and our international students, um, which is incredible to see. Yeah, I think, I think, and that's been our experience at Lifesaving Victoria because we deal with a lot of schools and we deal with a lot of pools, but um, a lot of the successful pools uh, have been able to I guess partner up with one or two key uh, groups, cold groups um, in the in the local community. There's no shortage of of, of people from the cold target group that could that you know that could benefit from um, yeah. um, and water safety education. So you mentioned before uh, about local council uh, websites. Um, there's all there's also the census. Uh, which is uh, very useful, and Victoria Multicultural Commission uh, is good as well. They have, a, they have a very handy site that breaks down different parts of, of Victoria. Um, talking about finding out about our community, do you, when we've learned about what types of communities, or what type of cultures and people that live in our communities, do you think that's important to know when you start designing a swimming program? And what sort of considerations would you need to make when you plan your program based on the type of community that you have? Absolutely, it's really important that you are designing the programs around 
what your community needs are. Um, that's pretty much one of the ways you're going to succeed in what you're offering. Um, you can't just kind of go out, I've got to put around you and implement it, but it's not targeting the people you need to target. Um, so you need to really have a good grasp of what your community is. So um, I've recently come to see Melbourne in the last 12 months and it was a huge learning curve for me changing the focus of what I was originally tagging my programs as to what I'm tagging them at now. Um, so things like your women's only programs, like is there people that are looking for them? Um, and so make those conversations and then figure out how it's going to work. Um, so a lot of centres I know these days are looking at women's only on a Saturday afternoon, but is because of their cultural needs, is a weekend actually going to work for them or are you wanting to look more during the week? So starting to have a good grasp and understanding of what you need to help them um, is basically kind of the first stepping stone for me is really getting out there and having those conversations and not just going, oh, I've got a program, here it is. It's, all right, let's work together. Let's start chatting about what would be best for you and then go from there. Things like childcare and things. And yeah. also really come into that um, because some parents just feel like they can't and it d does depend on um, whether they've got that community. If they've got a community where they've got um, that support or others encouraging them because, no, this is the kind of thing we can do, they are much more likely. But um, if there's not someone that they have a relationship with or they're not sort of connected to, it's a lot harder to just break into something that, you know, yeah. why would they? Yeah. And it's also the facilities themselves, being a facility, you need to be open to them. If you go into a facility and their first impression as they walk in the door is that the staff at the front are just connect or hesitant to assist, that straight away is a turn away. So you, you want your centres to be open that the people you're walking into at the door are engaged and understand that you uh, have cultural needs and that understanding of, um, even though we talk to people sometimes when they've got a different language, we, chat, we alter our tones and our mannerisms sometimes and it's understanding that we don't need to do that. Um, things like that is something you need to really take into consideration when you're interacting with our whole communities. Actually, I might advance a little bit here and just have a segue into something that I think you're touching on there, which is role models. In maybe one of your first questions, which is barriers to participation, um, role models is, is one of them. You know, I think part of the reason why, for example, as a kid I learned to swim is because uh, my parents wanted to swim and, and my grandparents wanted to swim. So people who just, people who learn to swim are role models. Mm. And what we're trying to do is to build up a generation of swimmers so that they pass it on, yeah. of, of swimmers who aren't swimmers at the moment, so that they'll pass it on um, to their kids and their kids will pass it on to their kids. Um, role models in a pool, aside from swimmers themselves, which are incredibly powerful, are people who work at the pool. So if you're going to um, help make people who are relatively new to Australia feel comfortable in a very strange place, what better than to have uh, people from their community, or at least other communities that aren't your typical traditional Australian communities, working at the pool, because they feel uh, more welcome. And I think what I've noticed over the years is that in the, um, they become very quiet billboards for water safety education and swimming because mums and dads come in, they might be coming in just for a social swim, they see somebody from their community uh, who works within the industry and they realise that this person is, you know, is, is a swimmer or some sort of an authority on water safety education. So the conversation about water safety at least goes on the table and people start um, thinking about it. And what we've found that um, once you start to get one or two people working in pools or uh, volunteering at a lifesaving club, then it does snowball. Mm -hmm. And with that snowballing effect, more and more people um, know about it, feel more comfortable about aquatics. And if you're lucky enough to get something, some real promotional bonuses like uh, a run on the news or in the newspaper, then those messages get spread um, significantly within the community, which really, really 
what she calls. Yeah, touching on a bit from there as well as um, the teams you've got helping you. So I've got a great team that do have a lot of um, different backgrounds and do speak a lot of different languages. Um, my little joy at the moment is I've got a swim teacher on a Thursday morning because the teacher who wasn't in Cantonese. No, sorry, Mandarin. Um, because the kids are mum and bus class and the grandma brings the, um, the grandson and doesn't speak a word of English. Um, and he alters between English and Mandarin. And watching it is amazing. Um, so having the teams that kind of help, that get people comfortable in those aquatic environments and just they're having them in their own language is just a huge relief um, for them. So um, really when you're recruiting your teams, like looking at what your options are, um, I was even surprised. I sent an email out to my team and go, I just want to know if anyone's speaking in different languages, just so I know. And I was really shocked by how many of them do speak different languages or might not be well, but enough to kind of have that social interaction to begin with. Yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah. I think that's a good point that you make is using the thing that you have and asking the question because if you've got a multicultural community, chances are that your staff will have some sort of background in um, be able to speak another language and if they don't then perhaps that's the first step that you need to take when you're doing your next recruitment is to ensure that your staff reflect the face of the community as well. Um, I was watching, um, as you said, one of the news stories about the Sudanese lifeguards in Frankston and the pride that they demonstrated in that news story about being the first Sudanese lifeguards at that centre was just infectious. So, And they were talking about becoming uh, role models for their community as well. Um, so I think if, again, if you're watching, if you have a chance to go onto um, YouTube, there's a lot of those news stories saved on the multicultural um, uh, link, I, I guess you call it, in YouTube. Um, and then you can watch their stories because they are infectious. The pride that they have for becoming lifeguards and then, um, you know, that next step to becoming swim teachers and reflecting their community and encouraging their community to become more involved in swimming and water safety. Um, and I think uh, LSV is doing some good work in that space as well. Um, yeah, well, we really rate the role model aspect of it, which is why you know, there must be, you know, there must be a dozen videos there. Yeah. Because if we go back even to 12 or 13 years ago when we started, at that point in time, really there's, there's just a, a middle-aged white guy um, telling people that if you do this, it'll be a good thing. But if you've got a 22-year-old, two-year-old Afghan uh, lad or an 18-year-old Sudanese girl, and there is the finished product. I mean, it, it's right there before your eyes. So uh, it's it's you don't have to take that leap of faith. You can you can see somebody who has a, who has achieved something, and if you're trying to, and it, that could have been an employment position, or it could have been a group of kids learning how to swim. Uh, if you can actually show people um, new to Australia that, then I think they. Uh, they get it very quickly and, and are willing to buy in very quickly. I'm sure, you know, over the years at, at your school you would have taken some video and some photos of it and of the program that, that you run there. And that would just put people at ease immediately uh, once they saw that. Oh, absolutely. And it, it really is so often word of mouth and people from you know, new arrivals or people who, who come to the school who aren't sure, it's usually someone from their own culture who encourages them to come in or is there as a translator or showing, making connections, introducing, that is the powerful thing of, of getting people into this program. I think it's important for people taking that step into something that could be a bit scary for them to see somebody that reflects them as well, whether it's be having females and males there or having somebody who represents their community um, helps them to feel more comfortable. So, you know, if they're on pool deck and, you know, they, they've cut themselves or they've got a blood nose, they don't know where the toilets are or they don't know how to swim, it's often easier for them 
which you ask for help if those people are approachable and that they're reflective of you know who they are as well. Having no um, chats with your cancers to see what they offer in terms of educating them of cold um, or interactions with them. A lot of cancers need days will offer courses or um, little training sessions on how to engage them and how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them are really um, brilliant. Like you know, it really kind of makes you question how you interact with them yourselves. Um, and I think it's invaluable to have understanding of how your perception of yourself is presented to them. Mm -hmm. um, so really, they're really good things to look into to see if your organisation or your facilities are able to engage some of those training services because they're invaluable. Yeah. I think if you're in a culturally diverse municipality, you're likely to be able to get um, cultural awareness training through your council, um, which is generally provided free because the council want you to engage those services as well. Um, now, Dan, I'm going to throw back to you again. We talked about the multicultural projects um, delivering training to 22,000 people annually. Um, when you deliver your programs, what sort of considerations do you take um, to make sure that the participants feel comfortable um, or alter your programs to suit what they're looking for as opposed to your average learn to swim program or beach program? Yeah, well, yeah, this last year was a, a record, it was 22,000. It's not all on training, a lot of it is, is education. So really what we have is, is a suite of activities um, and uh, the majority of work that we would do is in the classroom uh, and then uh, on the beach. So classroom education and beach education, uh, we oversee um, a lot of swimming courses uh, and then we also have the, the the training aspect where we train people as pool lifeguards and um, we we outsource the swim teaching to uh, to other contractors and also um, volunteers surf lifesavers so we have a, a big suite of activities uh, the the way that we've honed that over the years, I think, is to keep it keep it simple and fun. Mm -hmm. And the it's very important, I think, to as far as the education side is concerned, um, is, is to have almost like a homogenous group of deliverers that are often doing it. So, for example, we have a team of um, six or seven educators that purely do uh, our beach programs for, for newly arrived. So they're, they're aware of the tentative, tentativeness of the groups. Um, they, I guess, speak in a different way in so much as it's clearer. The resources that we use are very visual. Uh, we don't get bogged down in detail. Um, it, it's very much watch, watch and do. And it's very much um, revolving around a good fun day out at the beach. So that throughout the process of going from station to station, it's not really important whether you know how to use a nipper board or whether you, you can use a rescue tube. It's the slow passing over of water safety messages that occur over that three hour period and finding some enjoyment at that local beach so that you'll come back there next time. You'll know how to get there and you'll come back there and use it safely. Um, as far as the classroom is concerned, again, uh, the same deliverers going out regularly because they're used to, the, to that type of audience, which is very different um, to, to, to regular classroom teaching. So the participants, when they arrive at the program, this could be their first time that they've entered the beach water or... or and it often is. Yes. So it's not really, not even so much, it could be, it's a usual situation. Yeah. Really. How do you think they feel when they arrive as opposed to when they finish the programs? Uh, look, I, well, 
I think it's a mixture of uh, a little bit of hesitance, but generally speaking, uh, they're um, very enthusiastic. I mean, it's, it's something that um, uh, they're keen to do. They actually don't really know what's in store for them uh, during the day. I think they're probably thinking that it's, it's going to be a swim and a barbecue. Yeah. But we use that as an opportunity to get across these um, important water safety messages. We also do show them uh, each time that we're down the beach. We, we, we have a very visual presentation in the last five minutes is about role models. So it's actually a breeding ground for, or a recruitment ground for people who then might want to learn to swim, to progress, uh, to become a volunteer or to become a worker within uh, the aquatics industry. Lucy, what's your experience with students? You're running a very different type of program. Your students do two weeks of swimming lessons every year. What's your experience with those students who, on that first day, arrive at the swimming pool, possibly for their first lesson ever, to the end of their program, and, and how they feel about the experience? It's so lovely to see. Quite often, um, yes, yeah, students arrive and they've never been in the water and they don't know what to expect. They're not sure what this is that they're wearing, you know, bathers are not what they're used to. And um, at first, yeah, it's that real apprehension, I don't know if I can do this. Often, not in English, you know, we, we do have um, support and, and they might say, oh, look, this child's really nervous, you know, and, and we go slow. The, the swimming teachers are obviously amazing and, and know about um, anxiety around water and things. And so we usually go quite quickly from anxiety, and depending on the age of the child as well, anxiety, I don't know what's going on, I'm out of my comfort zone, help, to having the best time ever. And the self-esteem and the, the joy that they get out of it in just those two weeks is actually life-changing for some of them because they really can see that they can do something um, that they had never done before um, the social aspect is huge as well, is a really great um, learning tool for them. And yeah, it's really beautiful to sit back and watch these kids just blossom and that's what they do. So you mentioned that at the start of their lessons they might be quite anxious, they don't know, that they've never worn bathers before because often um, in other countries they might just wear shorts and t-shirts or whatever they wear if they go in the water at all. What, what strategies do you use or do the teachers use to overcome those anxieties and help those students feel more comfortable to participate? And Bridget, you probably elaborate on this as well. In the weeks leading up to swimming, the swimming teachers come to our school. They're really very supportive. And so they'll come to the school, they'll show pictures of the water, of what they expect you to wear, um, of the change rooms, and talk through the process. They'll talk about why it's important to learn how to swim. and. Um, and what they can expect. That's obviously translated. They get it on paper to take home to show their families. Um, we will then have those conversations in the classroom as well and bring in, um, you know, I'll bring my bathers in. This is my town. These are my bathers. These are what I wear when I go swimming. So lots of conversation, lots of role modelling. The children that have done it before talk to the other children. Some oldies will come in and talk about in their languages how it felt when they first did it, how they feel now, and really try and give a visual, but also those conversations, the language is so vital to just talk about it and give the children some idea of what to expect. I think that's a brilliant idea, using those older students to role model and share their feelings because it gives the opportunity for those older students to demonstrate leadership. Mm -hmm but also for the younger students to look up to their role models and help um, reduce those anxieties. And as you said, everything that you're doing is quite visual. As David said, when they present information, it's very visual and simple. Yeah, but also for those older students, it shows them themselves how far they've come. Sometimes they don't realise and, and they go, wow, the first time I went, I was so scared and now I can do a safety entry or, you know, work with a kickboard or um, they feel a real sense of achievement as well which is awesome. So 
from um from a colleague point of view, um, with the schools, the biggest thing I know is um, getting to know my team. Um, you'll have your team members which are really supportive and very patient with you when people are scared, and some that unfortunately like that's just their personality that might not be. So it's creating a team where they're needed. Mm-hmm. Um, so with my guys, I've got some that are trying to be school teachers, so they're very bubbly. Um, they're really great with those young um, younger guys or the lower levels that it's probably their first from the water, they've had no really experience. So they can ease into it. Um, it's even the management. So I know myself and my ASO, we're on the day. So the kids get to know us from when they walk in the facility um, each day where they're to greet them so they know us. So we build up a bit of a trust with them as well. So we can kind of help them ease into it, help settle them if they're nervous. Um, having those relationships is a really key thing in helping them, especially if you're in the classroom and they've been out of 40 weeks of a year, mm-hmm. you're in a different environment, it's loud, or there's different people around, and um, you're in a pool, it's too many different things, especially when you've got the younger ones, so you can't be preps to the year twos, which are at a very vulnerable age, um, and they're probably not used to this routine of going into swimming lessons, so um, Aquatic Centre, you really need to be there to kind of support the school teachers, um, your team need to be there to support um, teachers as well as the kids that they're teaching. Um, so for me, it's really understanding the team I've got on board, making sure that they're comfortable with what they're doing, um, building those relationships with the kids. Um, aquatic centres, it's great to kind of get a grasp and do the questionnaires or get to know the kids before they get into the building. So you're not sitting there day one and having five kids that have no work or experience in the deep end of a big, big pool. Like it's, Kind of getting that understanding of what the kids are before they walk into that door, um, which then just helps put everything at ease with them. I think the kids uh, or the youth, or in, in our case, you know, we, we deal with adults and families as well, whether it be their first swimming lesson, whether it be their first visit to the beach for a half day excursion, or whether it be the one hour classroom visit where we send a, an educator in. Um, the success of that particular experience typically uh, falls on a third party as well. Uh, with, with us, while in order to see those 22,000 people last year, we will go through two or 300 third party people, whether it be through a church, a person at a church, at a school, at a migrant resource centre, and in your case, uh, the swimming teachers, and, and in your case, um, it, it, it might have been the head of a group that were coming uh, to swim at your bars. So, if you are able to get across to that third party exactly what your objectives are, and and where kids in the past have really benefited benefited from it, or haven't benefited benefited from it. If you're able to get that across to that third party person who can then you know, brief the group, whether it be a school group or an outside group, then their experience is typically better. And that's why, and sometimes it's, it's as much as show some photographs. When we send out a booking con- uh, confirmation, we'll send out a 60 second video clip of a beach program. And we ask, we will ask the third party or the school just to show that in class. And straight away they can picture themselves there and it might be in the pool as well. And then they can see kids from their uh, cultural background. And they go, that's, that's how I'm going to be that day. It it's, it's demystifies things and um, quite often get a better result on day one. Mm. I think that's such a great point. And it goes back to keeping things visual, keeping things simple, and trying to reduce any anxiety that may be there by showing them what to expect on the day. Demystifying them. Yeah. Yeah. I think video is a great tool to use. And like you said, if you've got people in your staff or in your community who can speak in the same language as the people you're targeting, so either to promote students to engage in their swimming programs, something quick and snappy that they can watch to see what it actually is about um, could help get those messages across as well. Mm-hmm. Talking about getting water safety messages across and um, where we would find um, resources, I guess, do you have any ideas or any suggestions about um, what resources are available in possibly different languages? 
coaches or um, anything that centres or schools could use to um, engage people in different languages? Um, one thing that I do love um, using is some of the life Victoria resources, um, the Royal Life Society resources. Um, they have kind of fact sheets which you can print off in different languages. So um, I know we do kind of like a dedicated kind of water safety focus week every term, and then we've got the big water safety week in December. Um, so we always print them out and have them around um, the kind of members areas and around the facility. So people in different languages that might not specifically be there for swimming lessons um, are actually reading. So um, they've been handy. So we've kind of just left them hanging around here. Like we actually haven't specifically put them out and taken away yet. They're just um, around and they're really great because they there's so many different languages that you can print off and use. Um, so definitely that's one resource I definitely would recommend people using because you don't have to go translate it yourself, um, which is kind of easy. And the, multiple languages to choose from, which is amazing. And that's the Royal Life Savings. Royal Life Saving, yeah. And Surf Life Saving also have a little bit on their, mm -hmm. their website as well. But again, I, I think you also can't, you just can't go past uh, 60 second visual stories uh, with videos and yeah. photos as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, effectively it's proofs in the pudding, people get it straight away. And it's so simple to do. Uh, we were talking about how easy it is to do a Facebook live session today just on a phone. So if you've got a phone, you've got a camera, uh, my, uh, I would say make sure you get media release forms signed if you're using people's images, but it's very simple to do. If people are prepared to help and talking about communities, it sounds like people are very prepared to get involved in that type of environment. I will say one thing that, and this is something that we were exposed to very early in the piece, which was uh, to translate or not to translate. And when we go into a community group, or if we go into a classroom and deliver a water safety education session in a, in a period, there may be 20 nationalities in the room. So uh, it's impossible to have translations with that sort of diversity in a classroom. So, um, again, it comes back to keep your messages simple, um, deliver it clearly, and, and make it very visual and, and upbeat. And what we find that even with um, adults who probably tend to pick up the language, because we do a lot, we go to a lot of language schools, um, they tend to probably pick up languages a little bit slower than the than the kids, but in a classroom where there might be eight or nine different nationalities and there might be 40 people in the room, within that room, if you keep the resource pretty simple and end up be, what you'll find is that, the, is that uh, either the, the stronger English speakers will translate it uh, back into their languages so that uh, in, in this case here, we're not testing them on their English. We're trying to get across water safety messages. So it doesn't matter which language they get it in, as long as they get it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in the comment section um, on the Facebook Live, we have posted some links to the resources that we mentioned. So there's one there to the AIMS free um, teaching resources, which is the Adult Migrant Education Services. Um, so that's some adult um, information there. There's um, the Royal Life Saving Society um, translated fact sheet that you mentioned and Plate Safe by the Water Messaging as well. Um, we do have a few case, uh, case studies from Clayton South Primary School on our online toolkit, which you can see what they've done to um, encourage their school to participate in further swimming lessons as well because they've got quite a culturally diverse community. So if you head to our toolkit, that's available along with all the links to the resources which are on the Survival Swimming Program. Um, so that all the links to all those resources are there for you to click through um, if you like. But I guess that's a great segue for me to talk about Survival Swimming Programs um, as opposed to traditional Learn to Swim Programs. Um, and I guess I would like your thoughts on whether you think, so if students were only able to participate in say, five lessons or ten lessons a year, as in, in your case, 
do you think it's more appropriate for them to be doing something like survival swimming as opposed to traditional learn to swim or either either? Um, I'm very much of the opinion that survival swimming is a key thing. Um, they can swim a full cool 100 meter heavy freestyle, but if they're thrown open in the open water, are they going to be able to not freak out and be able to save themselves? So for me, survival swimming specific lessons are really important. Um, and I have started seeing the industry shift that is not so much about your traditional lessons parents are after these days. These I want my child to be safe in the water. Um, which is an incredible thing because when I first started swim teaching it was, oh no, why are you focusing on sculling? My kid doesn't even know that I want to swim freestyle. And now it's like, why are we doing safe entries and things like that? So it's been a great thing I've seen, but definitely survival swimming for me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, like was, was mentioned earlier, when people go to Bondi and don't know about a rip, they don't know the mechanics of a rip or, you know, it's something that's really vital because if they're going to be going on holidays, they're the kinds of things that they need to know if they're going to go swimming on their weekends or, you know, going to the beach. Um, swimming freestyle isn't as important as knowing how to swim across a rip. Yeah. So, yeah, I absolutely see the benefit. Look, I'm just happy if, um, if either of them are offered at this stage because there's such a gap. There's such a, it's such a rarity to get any sort of, um, um, I guess, learn to swim or survival swimming experience. Um, it, it, it'll, I guess it eventually comes down to uh, if, if the funding is available for either one of them. But at the moment, I guess part of the reason why our department exists is because neither of those things are happening enough. Mm -hmm. So we've got a couple minutes left, so I'm going to ask Bridget, I know you're doing a lot of different types of programs for not only school swimming but other community groups that attend your centre. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about what those groups are and what you're doing in that situation? Um, we're starting a lot over the last kind of six to eight months with the different communities. So we um, have partnered up with Medibank and RMIT and we're offering a university um, swim lessons. So we do that. Um, we do both an mixed group and women's only group, um, which has been incredible watching them. Um, we also work with Charles Sturdy Institute, a similar program with their water safety in mixed group. Um, we've also gone out to Charles Sturdy and done um, at the university um, a water safety sessions with all the students there. Um, so we've kind of started with that, um, but in terms of that, we're also about to do a Grand Medallion program, which is for older, adults age 55 and older, but given the um, kind of demographic of Melbourne, it's going to be very much a cold um, community type of group interacting with that. Um, and then just within our own swim school, um, about 40% to 50% of our um, swim school program is adults. Um, so it's incredible seeing the adults interacting and doing swimming lessons while their kids are swimming or just themselves are coming in and doing swimming lessons. So um, there are a few little projects that we're kind of working on at the moment, but there's um, more kind of plans that we've got coming along. So it's exciting. Brilliant. And we see uh, for schools who do have a high multicultural community, what would your advice be to them to encouraging their students to become more engaged if they're not already participating? Um, I guess it's it's breaking down those barriers. It's giving them access to the pool. So if wherever possible, funding those extra lessons. Not every school can, um, but yeah, as much as possible, taking the kids to the pool, taking away, demystifying, um, using those role models to show how great swimming is, how beneficial it is. Um, and yeah, just getting them in there and showing them, giving them the opportunities, I suppose, and building those relationships. I think that's a really big thing, showing them parents as well, because you can take the kids as many times as you want, but if the parents aren't on board, it's unlikely that later on they're going to be engaging in swimming. So building those relationships with parents, building that trust and showing how um, great it is to be able to swim. I think also too with, with schools, that would be part of the reason for having sessions like this is to, I guess, raise awareness that uh, water safety, uh, education and swimming ability is, is very relevant. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in these communities, and it is a real problem. And uh, it's a case with the community groups that we deal with and the schools that we work with as well is to is to be is to be aware of the problem. Uh, it would, I guess, it seems more obvious to us because we work in it, but it's not always the case. So. If we can intervene and explain to more people about how bad a problem it is, then hopefully community groups and schools will probably um, reconsider the priorities, I guess, within a school day and, and, and do more of it and find more time to do it and you know, talk more with parents about it and talk more with staff about it um, so as they understand the issue and, and, more, and are more involved, are more prepared to support it. And with our last couple of minutes, is there anything else that you would like to add, any advice that you have for anybody watching? Yeah. My advice would be whether it's a pool or a school, if it's if it's something that uh, where your passion is growing about this problem is to find a pool or a school that's done good work with it before and talk to them about it um, because they'll save you a lot of time. Yeah, linking up with other schools and, and community hubs that do have good programs in place and are. Uh, you know, have been running for a couple of years is, I would say, a really good start. I think people who are passionate are always keen to share, which I think we've seen today with our panel of experts. Um, some of the takeaways I, I got out of today's session was when we share our key voice safety messages to keep it simple using videos, visuals, um, make sure our programs are fun um, and engaging and using that, the community whether it's your staff, whether it's your teachers, whether it's other organisations and community hubs, but the community's there and they're the ones we're servicing, so let's use them to make sure our programs are engaging and meeting their needs. Um, so, as I said, the session is recorded, so if you missed the start of it or you've got, um, if you want to see any of the links that we have posted, they're in the uh, comment section. We do want to ensure that we're providing um, uh, workshops that are, are useful and relevant and needed. So um, we will post the, um, we have posted the survey links uh, in the comment section. So if you could please fill that out um, and let us know what you thought of today's session, um, that would be helpful. Again, we're here um, on behalf of the Public Water Safety Initiative, which is funded by the Victorian Government. Um, so thank you to them. Uh, a few reminders, we do have our Water Safety Week and a Beyond event coming up on the 4th of September. There are still spaces available and we have just released new tickets for aquatic centres to bring more than two participants. Um, and we did announce today that if you are very busy and unable to process your Victorian Water Safety Certificates, which we understand at this time of the year and coming into Term 4 will be even busier, uh, please bring them along. Um, if you want more information, contact us at schoolswimming at lsv.com and we'll post that in the comments. Otherwise, I sent out an email today with some further information and we will be processing your Water Safety Certificates at the event. Uh, we also have a Blue Connection session coming up on uh, the 28th of August, so next week, with Gavin Mahoney um, talking about leading teams. So if you haven't already enrolled into that session, um, I encourage you to come along to that one. Gavin's um, got a wealth of knowledge from AFL um, to Netball Australia to um, all sorts of different sports. and. That will be a fabulous session to come along to. Um, again, if you want tailored workshops, if there's anything that you want your staff to upskill in, please contact us and we can look at doing that. But otherwise, I'd like to thank my panel uh, for coming today and uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>